Good afternoon and welcome along to Unbelievable with me, Justin Briley. This is the show on Premier Christian Radio that gets Christians and non-Christians talking and debating. And what a show we have for you today. So pleased to say that my special guest on today's programme is Richard Dawkins, probably the world's leading atheist. And of course, I'll introduce our other two studio guests as we get into the topic of today's programme. If you want to find more debates on faith between Christians and non-Christians, then do visit the show webpage premier.org.uk slash unbelievable where you can subscribe to this program as a podcast and find many other features and resources well today our topic is the bible especially the old testament a new series on channel 5 began last weekend continues tonight saturday the 7th of december it's the bible tv series and before i tell you exactly what we're discussing on today's program let's hear a taster of what that series is all about He has promised descendants as numerous as the stars. Let my people go. We obey the law. Anything is possible. So I walk in the valley of the shadow of death. I am your king. God is bringing disaster from Babylon. I will make them bow. Freedom for the captives. Told over five feature length episodes. A story that changed the world. The Bible starts 30th of November on Channel 5. So the Bible TV series continues tonight. It had great ratings when it was aired in America. It's been shown all over the world. Now has hit UK shores. If you're planning on tweeting about it, can I encourage you to use the hashtag #TheBibleUK. Hashtag #TheBibleUK. And if you want to find out more about the series, meet the creators, get resources, and so on, we've got a web page dedicated to that on the Premier website. That's premier.org.uk slash the bible but today we're going to be debating the old testament let me introduce the topic and our guests you're unbelievable well as channel 5 screens 10 hours of the bible in a mini series this december i have three guests joining me to debate the rights and wrongs of the stories in the old testament as we ask today what do we do with the old testament Uh, what about things like the story of the destruction of sodom and gomorrah Or God asking Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac? Can we make sense of them for today? Or are they Bronze Age myths that we should be happy to consign to history, to the bin of history? Well, those three guests joining me today are Professor Richard Dawkins, well-known biologist and, of course, a leading voice in atheism. His best-selling book, The God Delusion, included a chapter on whether we can draw morality from the Bible. So we'll be asking him about that. His latest book is his autobiography, An Appetite for Wonder. Chris Sinkinson is a Christian pastor and lecturer in the Old Testament at Moreland College. His new book, Time Travel to the Old Testament, aims to show how the books of the Old Testament are realistic and relevant for today. Uh, Rabbi Josh Levy is from the Northwestern Reform Synagogue in London, also known as the Alith. Uh, synagogue. Uh, he's part of Reform Judaism as a movement and uh, is an occasional speaker and commentator on radio and TV. And worth saying for the record, as uh, if you're listening to this on a Saturday afternoon, we are pre-recording today's programme and so uh, there are no Sabbath rules being broken <laughs> in order for Josh to join us on the programme today. A very warm welcome to all of you gentlemen. Thank you for being with me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Richard, let's start with you, someone I've long wanted to have on this programme. So thank you for making the time to join us today. Um, what, what, first of all, would you want to just give us a little bit of background? And if people want the full story, of course, they can buy your latest book. But um, you, you kind of embraced atheism really in your late teens, was it? Yes, I suppose you could say that. But that's not got a lot to do with what we're talking about, which is the Old Testament. Indeed. Which you can appreciate as a work of literature, and I do. Yes, I mean, you, you've been familiar in that sense with the Bible from a young age, haven't you? Yes, indeed. Yes. And what sort of an impact would you say the Bible had on you as a youngster, and, and how did your views develop on it over time? I learned the stories of the Old Testament. I learned the stories of Genesis about um, Abraham and the stories of King David and so on. Um, as a child it, at school, I seem to have had a near-photographic memory in those days and, and almost seemed to know them by heart. Um, I suppose the 
sort of Christian attitude in which I was brought up was that um, the Old Testament God wasn't as nice as the New Testament God, and so we were kind of slightly warned off the Old Testament in a way. Um, but um, uh, I, I love the, 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 the books as literature in the, in the um, King James translation. I, of course, can't read the, read the Hebrew, and I have no time for modern translations, which seem to me to lose the poetry. Mm. So you can appreciate, as it were, especially in the King James translation, that there is a, a beauty of sorts to aspects of the Bible. Uh, there's certainly beauty in the in the English. I'm aware mm. that the books that made it into the canon are a pretty arbitrary collection, um, and and not to be treated with actually much more reverence than any of the or many of the other books that didn't make it into the canon. Mm. Well, something we could certainly open up in the course of the discussion today. Now, I understand you, you haven't had a chance to watch it, but um, throughout December, Channel 5 is airing a, a mini-series, in fact, 10 hours altogether, of Bible stories. Um, what, what do you think about that? Do you welcome people becoming familiar again with those Old Testament stories and so on? Yes, I, well, I haven't seen the programme, as you say. I, I will make a point of watching it in future um, I do welcome it in the sense that it's a part of our literary heritage in this country, indeed in our English language, uh, and you can't appreciate English literature without being um, familiar with some of the phrases, indeed many of the phrases. I think in The God Delusion I had a couple of pages solidly packed with phrases from the Bible which are familiar, proverbial, um, and you can't really take your allusions without them. Mm. Many people are probably not aware of the fact that they do come from the Bible, many of them from the Old Testament. So, so you in- encourage people to be familiar with the Bible, even though you obviously don't necessarily agree with, with all of the contents therein? Yes, I do. I, I encourage people to be familiar with the Bible for literary and historic reasons. Um, you also, of course, can't understand history unless you are, are familiar with the religious tradition of, of our country and other European countries. Mm. Okay, well, thank you for joining us on the programme today. And we're going to be getting into some of the issues that you outlined, um, well, several years ago now in The God Delusion, um, when you spoke about the, some, of the, some of the moral issues, especially in the Old Testament in Scripture. Uh, two other guests joining me in studio today to discuss this whole area. Rabbi Josh Levy is from the Northwestern Reform Synagogue. Um, Josh, thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure. It's great to have you on. A um, little bit of background to yourself. Um, you grew up within Judaism. Um, Absolutely. I've grown up in uh, progressive Judaism my whole life uh, and um, have been working at Alith, which is one of the largest synagogues in the country for the last five years. Um, and uh, progressive Judaism is a liberal religious movement. So we are um, engaged with scripture and with text uh, very deeply, uh, but also believe in progressive revelation. And obviously, we're going to talk a little about mm. how you uh, reconcile those two things as we go forward. And the, 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 the branch, if you like, of Judaism that you come from is as opposed to Orthodox Judaism, if you want to just briefly explain the difference. For sure. So the, the fundamental difference between Orthodoxy and uh, Progressive Judaism is in their understanding of the origin of Torah, the origin of, of uh, the Old Testament, and particularly the five books of Moses. So Judaism classically has had a principle called uh, Torah min Hashemayim, that the Torah is from heaven. And that principle came to form uh, much of what's modern day Judaism. Uh, Clearly, with Enlightenment, we came to understand that the Torah needs to be read. The Old Testament needs to be read in a different way. Uh, And uh, progressive Judaism has responded to those uh, those discoveries Mm. about text uh, and has kind of begun to think differently theologically and in practice about uh, what it is to be Jewish in the modern world. Uh, Chris Sinkinson, finally, thank you for, for joining us again in studio today. Um, you're, you're over at Moreland College um, down in, near Bournemouth. Um, tell us a little bit about what you do there. Well, in terms of relevance to this uh, show, I teach uh, Old Testament and uh, I encourage students to uh, wrestle with the text, including the problem passages, and to try and preach and teach and use it in ministry. So I'm a fan of the Old Testament. And uh, actually, I I found that very helpful, what Richard was sharing in terms of the value of the Old Testament as literature. I think that is a very useful kind of starting point. And uh, clearly, as a Christian, I would add to that that I come to the Old Testament through Jesus Christ. So it's my understanding of Jesus that informs how I read the text. Mm. And I appreciate what Josh said about progressive revelation, because I think that's a helpful 
term to use, that when we read the Old Testament, we recognise an unfolding revelation. We can't simply take something out of context as if it were a timeless uh, moment. We have to see Mm. it as part of a, Mm. a progressive revelation of God's character. And as a Christian, it's through Christ that I interpret the, the Old Testament. So that's how I understand this progressive revelation heading towards him, which is, of course, important, I think, for me, because it may be during our discussion together, we'll focus on what are sometimes called the terror texts in the Old Testament. And the uh, Bible TV series, I think, began with a disclaimer uh, when the first episode aired, saying that this program contains violence, viewers discretion advised, which, of course, our Bibles could have on the front. I think Richard might encourage that to be a, <laughs> an advisory comment at the front of our Bibles. I on, on demand. I had to tick a box that said I was <laughs> right. over 16 to be allowed to be in relationship with the Old Testament. So, and, and so um, j- just to say on these terror texts that... Um, yeah. I, it, these are not my favourite passages in the Bible. You know, these are not the immediate passages I turn to for my mm, devotional readings. Mm. That doesn't mean to say I want to cut them out and bin them, but it does mean that I place them in a context of a progressive unfolding revelation. And uh, the atheists are not the first people to struggle with these passages. Yeah. Christians have struggled yeah. with them down through the years too. Well, we're going to be getting into the discussion now. And if you'd like to take part, if you would like to send in your comments, and uh, we're going to hear some of your comments to the last few weeks of programming towards the end of today's show then do uh, get in touch via email. That's unbelievable at premier.org.uk. You can also tweet or Facebook me at unbelievablejb on the Twitter account, facebook.com slash unbelievablejb if you want to like the Facebook page of this show. And of course, all those links plus links to my guests, the Bible TV series and more available from the show webpage at premier.org.uk slash unbelievable thousands of people are subscribed to the podcast maybe you'd like to join them if you enjoy these kinds of debates between christians and non-christians if you're tweeting by the way to do with um, the show or indeed the bible tv series which continues tonight on channel five why not use hashtag the bible uk and if you want more resources specifically around the series meeting the creators and that kind of thing then do go to our webpage premier.org.uk slash the bible Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. And we're asking today, what do we do with the Old Testament? Is it historical? What do we do with the morality of some of those Old Testament stories? Professor Richard Dawkins, my special guest on the line today, a well-known biologist and leading atheist. Chris Sinkinson is a Christian pastor and lecturer in the Old Testament. And Rabbi Josh Levy is a reform rabbi from the Northwestern Reform Synagogue known as Elith. Coming back to you then, Richard, um, how, how do you take the, the Old Testament? Um, do, do you believe that it is essentially mainly fictional sort of literature? I'd be surprised if very much of it was factual. Uh, um, it, I mean, the, the, um, the, the early parts of it, the, 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 the Pentateuch is clearly the, uh, ju- the, ju- the Jewish foundational myth. It's a, it, it includes the, the creation myths and the, the sort of myths of the origin of the, of the Jewish people. Um, there's, I understand from archaeological friends, there's almost no factual content in it. Uh, there certainly isn't any factual content in the scientific parts, in the bits about creation of the world and the universe and so on. And I suspect there's rather little factual content in the stories of Abraham, of the, of the um, exile in Egypt, of the escape from Egypt, the Egyptian plagues and so on. Um, so it is, a, it is a collection of myths. They happen, they happen to be Jewish myths. Some of them are inherited from from earlier peoples like the Sumerians. Um, as myths, they are fascinating. I mean, myths all around the world are fascinating. Um, all three of us happen to have been born into cultures which uh, were immersed in, the, in this particular Jewish myth, as opposed to the myths of the, uh, of the North American Indians or of the, or of the Chinese or of the Indians or um, South Sea Islanders or any of the other myths or Africans, any of the other myths that we could have been brought up in. So there is really no reason at all to be talking about the Jewish myths any more than any of the other myths around the world. All of them are anthropologically interesting, but that's it. Hmm. Are you, you're looking a bit pensive there, Josh, in, in response. Well, I mean, I can understand why Richard would say that. Uh, as a Jew, obviously, I come to those texts uh, in a very particularistic way, which is um, they're my foundational myths. Uh, that is, I am necessarily in relationship with them if I am going to live as part of a Jewish religious and cultural life. So uh, they are the foundational texts 
of my people. They're the formative stuff of the religious and cultural life that I lead. I mean, I, I, as it turns out, I doubt that Rich and I will disagree very much on his, issues of historicity. What we're going to differ on, I think, is probably whether or not that text continues to enrich people's lives. Mm. And as a Jew, it clearly continues to enrich my life. It is the foundational myth of the people of which I'm part. Would it it's be fair? the, the yeah, formative could, could stuff I... that I do. It's mm. my, my poetry, my story, um, the source of the legal code which then came to shape my religious and cultural practice. So um, as a Jew, I have a very particularistic relationship with it. Go ahead, Richard. Well, I just, I mean, presumably you would agree that if you happen to have been born in China or, or India or, or um, Fiji or somewhere, you would say, well, the Fijian myths are the myths of my people, the Indian myths are the Hindu myths are the myths of my people. I mean, you, you recognize the arbitrary accident of the fact that you happen to have been born into a Jewish household, and that's why these are the myths of your people. Right, I mean, I think our, our own personal religious and cultural identities are... You know, inevitably arbitrary to some extent, um, and uh, but it is mine, and that's that's the for me to live as a Jewish life engaged uh, with my cultural traditions involves being in relationship with that text. I'd be interested, Chris, to, to, to but a couple of things that Richard pointed out as he started there. Um, he doesn't believe there's any historical <clears throat> basis really to, to most of the Old Testament. Is that something? you disagree with yourself? I would disagree with that. I think that just to, to clarify, there's a couple of words that we've been using so far that I do think need some unpacking. Mm. Uh, one is the word literal and what do we mean by literal mm. interpretation and the other is the word myth, which mm. um, uh, is very easy to use, but I think uh, there's a much more uh, a complicated debate around what we mean by myth. And in fact, to be honest with you, in terms of popular debate, I think the word myth has been so stripped of any clear meaning that it's almost a useless word which would have been much to the annoyance of someone like Tolkien you know who <laughs> spent so much time discussing mythology and, and the meaning of myth so just to take these two words very very quickly uh, first of all if I could go with the word literal first then what do we mean by interpreting the book literally literal does not mean simply interpreting something for its face value meaning you know that the sun rises and the sun sets you know this this is language we clearly know it's a conventional way of speaking about the relationship of the the sun to the earth as we view it from our our viewing platform likewise with the old testament we could talk about how there is a perspective on history in the world and that's um reflected in the way the stories are told so to interpret the Old Testament literally doesn't mean always taking it at its face value. It means taking it seriously for the kind of literature it is. And uh, myth, I don't think, is a particularly helpful word here. I mean, theologians use the word saga sometimes to describe the Old Testament. And I think that might be more helpful because when we think about the, the history of the Old Testament... I'm sure Richard would agree that there's a historical uh, kernel to the, the Old Testament story. I'm sure you know he wouldn't doubt that there are uh, there's there's a historical story unfolding, but it's to what extent is that wrapped up in uh, figures of speech and forms of writing and perhaps later traditions that have been incorporated into the story. That's what we'd need to disentangle. Mm, mm. But that, that there's a core of history, I'm, I'm absolutely... And, and you feel that that is confirmed by archaeology and so on when you, when you look into some of these core aspects of the Old Testament's history? I do. I, I, I've been involved in an archaeological dig in, in Israel and uh, for, for a couple of seasons. And what I'm aware of, I don't know which friends uh, <laughs> Richard was talking to uh, at Oxford, but there really is a wide open debate here. I mean, you'll have um, archaeology doesn't provide a discipline where things are coming up from the ground date stamped. I mean, until you get to coins anyway, they're not date stamped with a, a record of who said what to who. Uh, archaeology provides evidence which can be ambiguous, it needs explaining, and so there's a very vigorous debate going on in archaeology right now, and uh, there are those who hold to a minimalist position and would suggest that there's very little evidence at all for the events of the Old Testament, but there's a very significant uh, number of archaeologists, a very significant number, who would argue for what's sometimes called a more maximalist approach to reading the evidence, people like William Dever or Kenneth okay. Kitchen. Um, uh, sorry, I mean, I, yeah, I, do you disagree with that? Well, I don't disagree with that. I mean, I, I do think we, we need to be very careful about two things. One is um, perhaps the really fundamental question is whether historicity matters, uh, whether actually what, no, this is not a history book. That's not mm. its function. It's not a science book. It is a people's grappling with their identity, their story, their experience of the world around them uh, that then came to inform other people's doing of that same thing. So for me, I'm, 
as it happens, deeply unconcerned with historicity. That doesn't bother me okay. at all. I do think we need to recognise also that the Old Testament is not a unity, that there are different books within it doing different things. Clearly, there are points in the sort of pseudo-historical books at which uh, the Old Testament is describing events that we know took place because we have evidence, we have quite a lot of it in the British mm. Museum, which describes the event taking place. But the Bible isn't doing history, it's doing theology. So when the Babylonians rampage and destroy Jerusalem, we know that happened. We know that the Bible is describing it, but the Bible is doing theology. It's seeing that in terms of reward and punishment sure. and behaviour. It's doing a different thing. Do you, do you Richard, do you, coming back to you, do you think that the Bible has, the, the Old Testament especially, a, a, any value in terms of it, a moral dimension that it may cast Oh, upon. now you're changing the subject, and, <laughs> and that's an interesting change. Well, I, I just wanted to, you know, we, we'll cover a variety of subjects, hopefully. Yeah, I, think, I mean, agree with Josh that um, historicity doesn't really matter, but I think I put it in a slightly different way. It, it doesn't matter because um, you, you wouldn't be bothering to ask the question about the, say, creation myths or the tribal myths of the Incas or the Aztecs. Um, I mean, they are interesting, they're fascinating myths. Um, but you wouldn't be having a debate to say, is there any historicity in the stories of sun gods and things? The only reason we're bothering to ask the question about the historicity of the Jewish myths is that we happen to be brought up in them. But they are not special. They are, they are just tribal myths like any other. I mean, well, Chris, do you... Do could, you well, could I make a distinction there? Because, uh, you know, you gave a very helpful description right at the beginning of the... Uh, uh, power and influence of the Old Testament narratives on Western culture. And I'd go even further than that and say that even history writing itself can find its roots in, in the Old Testament, in the way the Old Testament was written. Not that it's history, you know, except Josh's point that it's not history as in a modern history textbook. It's not science as a modern science textbook. But in terms of a history, it, it formulates a way of describing events which have a certain linearity and a certain meaning which is reflected in the historical traditions, which will, you know, we also look to the Greeks and Herodotus, but in terms of the modern world, our development of, of history and our understanding of history reflects a, a view which we find in the Old Testament, which I don't think we find in the Chronicles of Babylon. I don't think we find them in the Inca myths. I mean, that's for sure. So you, you would, in a sense, then say these it's it's not just sort of equal weighting between different myths around the world. There's something quite unique about the, Absolutely. the Old Testament. OK, Richard? I, I just don't see that. I mean, uh, um, it, it, um, I, mean I, I, I notice you're quite happy about using the word myth for the Inca myths and the, and the, and the Aztec myths. Yes, I, I mean, I, I'm not saying that the word myth... That, well, I'm using it because you used it uh, to, to describe their stories and legends. And, uh, you know, I, I do accept there is a category called myth. I just want to define it very carefully. Yes, I mean, I, I think, think myth myth does not have that rooting in linear historical progression. No. And that's where I think our modern understanding of history has a much more of a reliance on the Jewish tradition than would have come out of the Inca mythological cycles. You know, stories which aren't rooted in time and place. I mean, we find that in the great Hindu epics as well, which, again, are not rooted in time and place, not concerned with the genealogies and the locations and who was king when, in the way that the Old Testament narrators were. Yes, Richard, and then we'll bring in George. Well, that, that may be so. I mean, I, I, don't think it's a very, um, it's a, I don't think it's a very deeply important point. If, if it's so, I, I, I suspect the same is probably true of, of some other mythologies, um, I, I don't want to make a big thing of it. But, but it's mm. deeply important in terms of our respect for the historical processes and the development of history as a Western discipline. And uh, well, you know, that, that's why this is important. I mean, it's foundational for more than just the Jewish people. It's foundational so much of in other the, respects. There's so much of the Old Testament which is taken to be historically... I mean, not, both, both of you gentlemen are, are sophisticated who don't do this, but <laughs> the fact is that more than 40% of the American population... <laughs> think that the book of Genesis, including the six-day story of creation, is literally true. And um, th this is a problem which I have as a, as a scientist, and I hope and believe that both of you stand up and vigorously <laughs> oppose such literalistic fundamentalism. Right, well, but I think that's, that is because we recognise, certainly I recognise, that that's not the function of this text. Uh, I mean, I want to come step back a little bit, because mm. I think Richard is actually asking probably one of the fundamental questions about religion, which is, why should we privilege this particular text over any other text? Exactly. What is it that gives it its 
uh, enduring power, if it has any, uh, and how do we then engage with it? And, you know, classically, the answer would be something around authorship. That is, that there is a divine authorship that gives this text its weight, gives this text its authority. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we may also say there's something in the values of that text, which uh, something it expresses, or it may be that very personal relationship that lots of people have ended up with that text. Uh, and then, you know, my job as someone working in religion is to help that journey to be one which is done with integrity. Well, well if, if I may, I will move the, the subject along a little bit. And, and um, th there was a very famous um, long f sort of description of God, the Old Testament God in, in the God delusion. Uh, Richard, and, and I'm sure you, you know what I'm about to mention. Um, you described the God of the Old Testament, you said, is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, oh, <laughs> pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Quite a mouthful. Um, do you still stand by that description of the God of the Old Testament? That yes, you, that I you do. Gave? Um, I mean, it, I, I was accused of anti-Semitism by the recent chief rabbi, Jonathan Sachs. I don't know why he thought, thought it was anti-Semitic. It's anti-God. Um, <laughs> but I mean, that, 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 of course, refers to, to what, what's been called here the, the terror passages. Um, and the terror passages are taken literally by some particularly American theologians, um, and many, many people do actually believe, as I think it was Josh was recently saying, um, that the Bible is authored by God, and God, in those terror passages, which are not negligible in the Old Testament, they're actually quite prominent, um, is a horrifically unpleasant character. No, you no getting away from that. Okay. Um, as you mentioned, the chief rabbi former chief rabbi Lord Sachs said that he thought it was a profoundly anti-Semitic passage in the God Delusion. What, why, do you, why do you differ from him on that? He, he suggested that you were continuing a strain in certain anti-Semitic thinking that, that was essentially about saying, well, we've got a better God in the New Testament than in the Old Testament and so on. I, I, I don't think we've got a better God in the New Testament. I think there's something exceedingly unpleasant in the fundamental Christian doctrine of atonement the idea of um, God being unable to forgive our sins unless he tortured his, his son, alias himself, in the first place. And what, that's, that's a revolting doctrine, actually. In some ways, it's worse than anything in the Old Testament. But that wasn't the point. When I said the God of the Old Testament, I simply meant the God of the Old Testament. What Rabbi Sachs heard was the God of the Jews, which, of course, is true. But that wasn't why I was singling it out. Um, I was singling it out because the the terror passages are literally horrible. Mm. Well, it's probably not uh, something we'll have time to uh, address uh, on today's programme, unfortunately, uh, though I'm sure uh, Chris Sinkinson, our, our Christian guest today, would take a different view on that. We're we going to a short break and, and we're going to keep talking about the Old Testament morality. Uh, what about the story of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, or Abraham nearly sacrificing Isaac? Uh, don't forget, you can also get in touch. Uh, we're going to give out the ways to get in touch again uh, at the end of the next section. My guests today are Richard Dawkins. Chris Sinkinson and Rabbi Josh Levy. We're talking about the Bible TV series. You can find out more about it and resources at premier.org.uk slash the Bible. And you can find this program and links to my guests at premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. We'll be back in a moment's time. Are we the products of chance or intention? Does the cosmos leave space for God? Does Darwin dispense with God? Does the human mind reflect a mind behind the universe? Exploring the God Question is a new six-part DVD study series investigating a major talking point of our time, science and God. Some of the world's best scientists and philosophers arguing from both sides of the debate with open, frank and rigorous discussion and fascinating results. Exploring the God Question is designed for individual or small group study as well as for schools and public presentation. To order and find out more, visit thegodquestion.tv slash explore. Explore the search for truth. You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio. Welcome back to the show with me, Justin Briley. 
Uh, today, a rabbi, a Christian and an atheist. Yes, it sounds like the beginning of a joke, uh, but uh, they're joining me in studio and on the line. We're debating the historicity and morality of the Old Testament as Channel 5 screened the Bible TV series throughout December. It was phenomenally successful in the USA. How will it fare on UK shores? Well, there's loads more uh, info, resources, uh, interviews at premier.org.uk slash the Bible. If you are planning on watching the second episode tonight on Channel 5, Five or catching up with the first episode, uh, do tweet what you think about it, hashtag the Bible UK. Would love to hear your thoughts as well via email, unbelievable at premier.org.uk. And you can uh, interact with the show via our Twitter and Facebook account at unbelievablejb if you're a Twitter user, facebook.com slash unbelievablejb to like the page. All those links and more, links to my guests, links to the series and so on from the, uh, the show page of Unbelievable. That's premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. So my guests today are Professor Richard Dawkins, a well-known biologist and probably the leading atheist voice in the world. His best-selling book, The God Delusion, included a chapter on whether we can draw morality from the Bible. That's what we're talking about today. And Chris Sinkinson is a Christian pastor, a lecturer in the Old Testament at Moreland's College in Bournemouth. Uh, his new book, Time Travel to the Old Testament, aims to show how the books of the Old Testament are realistic and relevant for us today. Our other contributor is Rabbi Josh Levy from the Alith Northwestern Reform Synagogue in London. So just in that last section, we had Richard defending this passage in The God Delusion <coughs> where he describes the, the God of the Old Testament. I know both you gents, um, Josh and Chris, want to come back on this. And um, Perhaps we'll start with you, Josh, sure. as, as a Jew. Um, d- did you uh, sort of get where... The, the, the former chief rabbi, Lord Sachs, was coming from in, in saying that? Uh, for, I mean, for what it's worth, I, I didn't read that as being remotely anti-Semitic. Um, you know, I read The God Delusion like lots of people involved in liberal religion did because actually we're grappling with the same issues that Richard is grappling with. Um, you know, I was irritated by bits of it. I enjoyed bits of it. I was offended by none of it. Um, what I was concerned about was um, how simplistic that line is uh, because what it fails to recognize is that the Bible and particularly the Old Testament is not univocal. It has a number of different texts within it and it has a number of different versions of uh, how we can understand God within it. Inevitably, because it's it's a product of different people and different times grappling with those very issues. So um, the vindictive God whom Richard describes uh, is one version. I think we maybe want to argue about the use of the word vindictive. Uh, but, you know, there is also a deeply, deeply ethical God who 3,000 years ago is saying to the Israelites, you have to care about the vulnerable in your society. You have to do your business honestly. You have to look after your workers. You have to care about the immigrants who comes into your society. So um, to only describe the God of the Old Testament in that way, I think, is actually uh, just simplistic and doesn't help us to really engage with the Old Testament as a whole. Richard, any response? Are you- yeah, I, I, I accept that, of course. Um, it, it, was, um, it was a passage that I was... It was semi-tongue-in-cheek, actually, because, um, well, when I do public readings of, of my books, I do, th- do it with my wife, and um, we usually try to get a laugh from the audience early on in our performance because it sort of lightens up the atmosphere. And that passage we always used when doing the God Delusion readings right at the beginning, because it does get the audience roaring with laughter. Um, and it sort of makes the, put, puts the audience in a, in, a, in a friendly mood simply because they laugh. Mm. So there was a sort of, I mean, I think I went on to describe um, a story of Randolph Churchill, who had a similar reaction. He'd never actually read the Bible before, and he was challenged by Evelyn War and a brother officer during the war to read the Bible. And he kept on exclaiming how horrified he was by, 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 by God. Um, and so it was a sort of humorous, humorous passage. Mm. And I do accept that if you, yeah. if you look through either the Old Testament or the New Testament, you can certainly find passages of wisdom, passages that one would ethically approve of, tucked in amongst the, the others that one wouldn't ethically approve of. I suppose I am... I spend a lot of time in America, and I'm very conscious that the bulk of my audience, um, the audience, not the bulk of them, but the audience that I'm really trying to reach, is largely an American audience. And I, I, I presume that both Chris and Josh know how many people in America actually do take the Bible literally. And you have to read the God delusion through, 
through that filter that I'm actually aiming it, at least partly, at those people in America who are my enemies as a scientist, who are actually subverting scientific education in a, in a very serious way. So in a sense, I wasn't trying to irritate nice, decent liberal theologians like... Well, well, I mean, can, can I come in on this one, uh, Richard? By, I mean, I, I would say straight away that I'm not offended at all. And uh, it's certainly with my, my friends, uh, with, with other Christians, I would want to defend to the hill your right to uh, crack jokes. And, uh, you, know, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not one for blasphemy myself, but I certainly think that we need to have the, the tolerance and freedom in society to allow this kind of sometimes knockabout stuff. You know, I mean, I think that is, is perfectly legitimate. And so I think... Uh, to start being offended by it, I think there's a kind of political correctness in our society that's very dangerous, actually, because it can prevent us from having frank and open discussion. The, the problem, though, I think, and Josh touched on it by talking about the, the simplification that's going on here, is that, Richard, you are very good with rhetoric. You have a very uh, powerful mastery of the English language. And that rhetoric can be very bullying sometimes. And I think the way in which that passage is put, again, I'm not, you know, don't worry, I'm not saying that I'm offended or, or you take the passage out. I'm not suggesting that. But in terms of the passage, it's clearly a very slanted view of how to read the text of the Old Testament. I mean, most of us would take the clearer passage to interpret the harder passages. We would be talking about Leviticus 19, love your neighbour as yourself, before we're looking at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So, you know, we would have an approach to Scripture that would weight things in such a way that that description of God just does not sound like the God who I believe in or the God who I worship. So um, the, the, the rhetoric, I think, can generate a lot more heat than it does light. That's probably fair, yes. Okay. <laughs> it must um, be terribly reasonable. We are. It's a very reasonable, it's a very reasonable discussion. Um, yes, I need, I need more fireworks, everyone, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, uh, let, let's talk about some of these so-called terror passages, though. And they were right there on our screens on Saturday night on the first episode of the, the Bible. And I think we often forget the fact that there, there are some pretty interesting episodes. Now, um, y you certainly bring up a couple of these in The God Delusion Richard, let's talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, for instance. Now, um, that is the, the, the story in uh, Genesis, uh, I think it's chapter 19, in which Lot uh, has angelic visitors uh, and the townspeople come and they demand that they essentially rape these, these visitors that he has with them. Um, and he tells them not to do that. He, and he essentially offers his daughters instead. Um, but then there is sort of a, an intervention by God and lot and so on escape fire and brimstone rain down on, on Sodom and Gomorrah now Richard for you is this an example of a sort of morally repugnant story in in the Old Testament I would only want to say something like that if there were anybody who took their morals from the Old Testament and um, if, if you take your morals from the Old Testament then that is a repugnant story as are some of the other other ones but I hope you don't take your morals from the Old Testament. There are people in America who do. And those are the people that I need to call the, their attention to stories like the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and of Lot offering. Well, now, you say they, they take... I mean, I, I don't personally... I know quite a few evangelical Christians in America, but I, I don't know any that base their morality on this story, for instance. I no, don't, but how do they decide which stories to base their morality okay. on? Mm -hmm. It's all very well saying love your neighbour as yourself is good, or the Sermon on the, on the Mount is good, Sodom and Gomorrah is horrid. Um, but when you decide which of those stories to base your morals on, you're not using biblical methods to, in order to do your deciding well, well, you're using the methods of a mor <laughs> of a modern moralist which all three of all four of us are not at in all, order Richard. to pick out the good verses from the bad i, I think chris no, sinkinson uh, wants to come well, in well, here, yeah. sorry Richard, no, I'm, 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 i would be using normal methods of interpretation where we look at the genre and we ask what what is the passage doing what is a book doing what is the context doing and in particular is it prescriptive or is it descriptive now leviticus 19 i think is giving prescriptions we still need to interpret them in terms of their time and place in the ancient near eastern worldview but there are prescriptions there i need to deal with and find the principles from which i can learn with the sodom and gomorrah story it is a descriptive passage that is appalling and and to try and base any morals on the sodom and gomorrah story 
I, I, I wouldn't even know where to begin because I don't think it's that kind of literature. I don't think it's giving us a prescription for life. In fact, actually, Richard, if I may, I think you you make a great comment on the Sodom and Gomorrah story and the behaviour of Lot because you reflect on Lot in the God delusion. And then your summary sentence, I think, is very perceptive. You say, if this dysfunctional family was the best that Sodom had to offer by way of morals, some might begin to feel a certain sympathy with God and his judicial <laughs> brimstone. Well, Rabbi Dawkins, I mean, I think... I, I'm very happy with that gloss. <laughs> well, okay. Um, but I, I, I still worry about people who, who you're, I know you're not one of them, but, but that, there are people who think the Bible is literally true. There are people in America, many, many of them, who want to have the Ten Commandments hung up in courthouses, um, contrary to the Constitution. Um, and although you can find a decent commandment among the Ten, thou shalt not kill, uh, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor, etc., um, most of them you wouldn't actually want to base your life on. And that, yet there are people, I know you're not among them, but there are people who do think that we should derive our morals from the Ten Commandments, from the, from the Old Testament. What do you think about basing our morality on the Ten Commandments then, Josh? Well, I think it's important to recognise that within Judaism, the Ten Commandments are just seen as uh, ten of, classically, it's understood as being 613 commandments. Um, clearly, some of the issues that Richard raises also apply to those prescriptive sections, those legal sections which are interwoven into uh, particularly the five books of Moses, because clearly there are legal sections which are also um, abhorrent to us in terms of our modern morality. Uh, but I do believe that the, the Torah in particular has within it some values that it expresses, some ideals within it which are hugely modern and continue to have the capacity to enrich our lives today. Uh, and also that the stories, even those terror texts, have the ability to raise the questions that are exactly our questions for today. Uh, and that's always been the Jewish approach. So, um, you know, 2,000 years ago, the rabbis were asking exactly the Rabbi Dawkins questions of the text that they had inherited from, from the thousand years previously and were exactly grappling with what do you do with Lot uh, and condemning him. You know, mm -hmm. Judaism has never read the Old Testament uncritically. So they were condemning Lot. They were looking at sections, uh, for example, around capital punishment and saying, hold on a minute, this seems arbitrary, this seems unreasonable, we have to, to think about how we actually process this, this can't be exactly what, what is meant, we shouldn't really mm. take this on face value. So, um, you know, I, I think the authentic religious approach to the Old Testament is the one that reads it critically and which engages with it in that very critical way. But, but. When, you do, when a modern person or when the rabbis down the centuries that you're talking about look at the scriptures and interpret them in the light of their modern, in their own time, and we in our time, our modern morality. We do that in the light of our modern morality. Why bother with the scriptures at all? Why not just go straight to the modern morality and cut out the middleman? Mm -hmm. right. well, 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 let's allow yeah, like Chris well, in on well, this one. I mean, here's where my enthusiasm for the Old Testament wants to bubble over, because... <laughs> Uh, you know, when we come to, you're right, we look at modern morality, we talk about the modern morality that we use. But let's also give credit to the Old Testament world and reflect on the mor morality in terms of the ancient Near Eastern worldview. Now, in that context, here is enlightenment. Here is an approach to the widow, the orphan, the refugee that I actually find very beautiful. I mean, I, I recognize the terror texts. I recognize the issues of interpretation with problematic passages. But, but written through it all is an approach to society which is fundamentally egalitarian. And in order to see that, we have to compare the Old Testament documents with texts from that time, such as the law codes of Hammurabi. Now, those Babylonian law codes have many parallels to the Old Testament, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But the way in which the Old Testament is very different from the, those legal codes from Babylonia, they, they highlight this egalitarian approach to life, the privilege of the poor, the importance of responsibility that those who are in power look after those who are vulnerable. Uh, the Sabbath rest command, I, I find that a very beautiful command. I don't follow it. I'm not, not Jewish myself. I don't follow it in that sense myself. Uh, I could be broadcasting on a Saturday. But the Sabbath law I find very powerful because it describes the, the privilege given to the animals to take a day of rest. Uh, the land ultimately gets rest 
slaves get rest. You know, and we want to talk about how it regulates uh, an issue like slavery in the ancient world. You know, slavery common throughout the ancient world, but at least the Old Testament is regulating. That so, kind are you of saying behavior. that the the Old Testament law then and morality? Um, is actually in some sense a, a foundational stone upon which our modern morality, the Richard says, let's go straight for that, r- well, well, rests in some way. Well, I, I, I think that's true. I mean, that's a historian's judgment. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not suggesting I'm best placed to make that judgment. I, I think so. But I, I'm more saying, look, let's enjoy the power of the Old Testament and read it in its own light, you know, read it in the context of the ancient Near East and what was going on in the ancient world. Let's not be anachronistic about it and read it in terms of a modern context where, for example, we have a well-developed prison system uh, where we, we wouldn't need to depend on the death penalty in the way they did in the ancient world. But let's go back to the ancient world where they didn't have those privileges and benefits that we have today and see, well, actually, in the context of the ancient world, this is an enlightened text. I, I mean, there is the challenge, though which is a very real challenge for us as moderns engaging with religion and with with those ancient texts, which is on what grounds can we and should we privilege one particular part of the text over another? Mm. Uh, You know, and that's and that's a very real question. Of course, it is the nature of our struggle. Right. And, and, you know, I I think what Richard speaks to and um, I'm very pleased that he does is that religion is not simple. And it shouldn't be simplistic. And uh, those really difficult parts of the text, we have to work out how we deal with them. Uh, and it is very, you know, it's very easy to say, you know, there are bits of the text which are progressive for their time. And they were incredibly. Or to say that there are values underpinning some of the Old Testament texts which are modern and uh, have real resonance for us today. And of course there are. Um, but we're also told that we need to stone our rebellious son. Um, and we have to engage with that text as well. Now, um, I, I'd just be interested in your p- point on this, Richard. Is this just theologians picking and choosing? That's essentially what you seem to say. Well, y- the- yes. And, uh, I mean, <laughs> when we say that we that we uh, we look at our modern morality and um, we are all 21st century moralists and we disapprove of slavery and we believe that women are equal and things like that. Um, we can look back in history to, and look at various historical traditions and discover nuggets of that in in the Jewish tradition, in Christian tradition, in Confucianism, uh, in Buddhism, in Hinduism, uh, in moral in the, all the great moral philosophers. Of course, our modern morality has its historical developments, which we ought to acknowledge and ought to study. But we shouldn't be bending over backwards to look at a particular text which happens to be ours, namely the uh, the um, the Bible or the or the Old Testament, and struggle manfully to understand it in terms of of modern. You know, find the good bits and and re- reject the bad bits and interpret the bad bits in terms. I mean, why bother? Why not just look at our modern morality and say, yes, this has historical precedents from all over the world, and it's good to look at them. But we don't have to spend all our time trying to find the bits of the of the our particular holy text, whatever it is, whether it's the Quran or the Old Testament or or, or whatever it might be, trying to find the bits that fit in with our modern mm. morality. Mm. Let's keep let's keep our morality separate and think about it as moral philosophers, albeit acknowledging that it has historical roots. And I suppose that's that's where we're going to really diverge because my answer to that would be because that's the human exercise Uh, and that's been a very powerful human exercise for thousands of years and that particular text uh, because of the stuff that's within it which is horrible as well as the stuff that's within it which is so precious uh, is a mechanism for us to ask those really deep questions that's really what's crucial for me is that this is a text which enriches our lives now as a Jew, I'm necessarily almost in relationship with that text. But, you know, I believe it also has the power to enrich the lives of other people because of that breadth uh, and because of our ability to struggle with it. Just be interested, Richard, to get your, your views. And again, this is uh, an example you bring up in The God Delusion. And it was, again, part of the first episode of the Bible TV series. Very dramatic scene where Abraham takes his son Isaac up, having been commanded by God to sacrifice him. Uh, this is, of course, um, 
found in Genesis chapter 22, the story of Abraham almost sacrificing Isaac, but God provides a a ram caught in the thicket at the last moment. Um, Now, you described it this way in The God Delusion. By the standards of modern morality, this disgraceful story is an example simultaneously of child abuse, bullying in two asymmetrical power relationships, and the first recorded use of the Nuremberg defence. I was only obeying orders. Yet the story is one of the greatest foundational myths of all three monotheistic religions. So you really object to this story in terms of its moral viewpoint. Well, I trust that that nobody thinks it's a morally good story. I mean, it's sometimes interpreted as being God's way of telling Abraham that you don't sacrifice humans anymore, you sacrifice a sheep instead. Um, My feeling there, since God was, according to the story, able to talk to Abraham, why didn't he just tell him, Um, (laughs) rather than put Isaac through this horrific ordeal. Clearly it isn't true. Nobody seriously thinks it's true, except at least 40% of the American population who think that everything in the Bible is literally true, and almost all of the Islamic world who think that the parallel story of Abraham nearly sacrificing Ishmael is literally true. Um, But nobody in this studio uh, thinks well, that this is literally Well, let's find out from Chris Singens. Uh, <laughs> well, I, 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 I'm guessing you're not as liberal as Richard no. is, is assuming you are, perhaps. <laughs> no, perhaps, I'm not Chris. wanting to agree with Richard on this. Uh, not at all. Uh, I mean, I, obviously, I'm, I'm going to also have to comment again on this word literal. I mean, I, I believe this is a historical event. In terms of what we mean by literature, though, this is very important because I've been helped very much, actually, by the Jewish theologian Robert Alter, who uh, has described the art of biblical narrative, that, of course, these uh, historical events have been presented to us in terms of Hebrew narrative, following certain conventions. And actually, at that point, when we read the story, we discover what a beautifully crafted story it is, the way it builds up tension, the way in which there's not really a narrator's voice telling you what to do with it. There's a real sense in which it provokes a lot of questions rather than necessarily answering them easily. But that it's a historical event event behind it, I'm not quite sure why you would want to dismiss that. I mean, uh, obviously, if we didn't have the book of Genesis, we're not going to have an archaeological dig that will discover the remains of the the altar. I mean, it's it's quite fair that there's there's no way of uh, confirming this from outside of the the text of Genesis. But I don't see any reason to dispute its historical uh, reality. I don't know why it would be included if it weren't. But really, that's, that's neither here nor there. In terms of the story itself, this is a story which I think is taken as the the end of child sacrifice for the Israelite people. And yet that's surprising because in the ancient Near East, ch- child sacrifice, human sacrifice was common. It was practiced in the, the among the surrounding peoples. And of course, Abraham had to learn who is this God he was following? What kind of God? Is it another God that wants the sacrifice of children? Uh, you, you say God may have just told him that, but I don't think life is as simple as that. Sometimes we need to learn lessons and of course we can't simply lift that story out of a a context that at least claims to be nearly 4,000 years ago and uh, suggest it could happen today. Uh, Not for one moment would I want to condone anybody who suggests that God would tell them to do an evil wicked thing today but in its context when these things were not known God was progressively revealing his character and this next stage in, in the Genesis account is to understand that this God that Abraham worshipped is not the kind of God who had request or require okay. the sacrifice of a child. Be interested in your response to that, Richard. Obviously, Chris, painting a, that this is actually, um, rather than being a horrific story, a rather a good good picture it's of the Words fail me. I mean, th- there you have the theological mind <laughs> in all its glory. <laughs> um, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I take it that's not a compliment on but, your part, uh, Richard. It's not a compliment. <laughs> um, um, I, I'm actually rather shocked that you, you, you even consider the possibility that it, that it happened. Um, I thought that what progressive theologians did was to say that these things are symbolic. They're moral stories, but, but, a bit like Aesop's fables. OK, but w- like. w- why would you say that that one is symbolic and not, say, because a later that, story regarding King Hezekiah? Said, I mean, you just why? said that, that it's neither here nor there whether it happened. You said what really matters. Well, well for our conversation. It's a powerful story yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which, which drove home the, 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 the moral that unlike the surrounding peoples mm-hmm, of mm-hmm. Canaan, um, the, the Jews should stop sacrificing children. And so um, it's, a, it's a moral tale like an Aesop's fable. Nobody actually uh, thinks that Aesop's Can it not be both and? Well, that's, that would be my point. Can it not be both and? I mean, I have you know, no, no question that there's a moral to the story, but that the story can be true as well in other senses with a historical kernel to it. That I, I can't see why we have to you choose. You mean you think 
God actually told Abraham to sacrifice his son and then reprieved him at the last It's described very briefly in the Genesis account, so I can't tell you all the details about how that may have happened, but that's, that, it's based on a historical event. I mean, can't, can't you agree that there's no reason why it couldn't be based on a historical event? Of course, if you don't believe in God, you're not going to believe that God spoke well, to I mean, Abraham. It, 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 it may be based on a, on a historical Come event, on. in which case it's shocking. OK, but at least the, the, we're just agreeing that uh, to, to say that we can treat it as a, a tale with a moral doesn't mean it can't be based in real history. No, but so, I mean, I, 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 I was giving you, I was charitably giving you the benefit of the doubt. I don't <laughs> want that charity. <laughs> uh, once again, I think we're sort of being okay. driven off the, the really important question here. So uh, uh, as I'm, I'm largely indifferent to questions of historicity. Uh, what we do have here is a narrative which is incredibly incredibly rich so uh chris has referred to the um literary nature of the work and we know that um, many of the biblical narratives are extraordinarily crafted narratives uh using uh, word play and playing with time and leaving questions open and uh, this is a really fabulous piece of literature particularly in the original um but it's also rich morally as well so i think you know where i would disagree with either of you is to say there is a moral to this story there are multiple morals to this story the old testament um certainly the torah is not there to tell us what we're supposed to think in these sorts of places it's there to raise a whole bunch of questions for us that we then have to grapple with if we're going to live well in the world now there are other ways of asking those questions but the Old Testament's a really good one. Well, we're going to have to go to a quick break. We'll, we'll get final uh, thoughts from our guests, Richard Dawkins, Rabbi Josh Levy and Chris Sinkinson, uh, as we conclude today's programme. If you want to get in touch yourself, if you want to uh, subscribe to the podcast of Unbelievable, where we have a weekly debate between Christians and non-Christians, sometimes between Christians of different views, then premier.org.uk slash unbelievable is the place to go uh, and if you want to find out more about the bible tv series go to our resource page on that premier.org.uk slash the bible so i'll be back in a moment uh, continuing to tell you what else is coming up on today's show as well as wrapping up this conversation with my guests on the historicity and morality of the old testament the church is facing a crisis of confidence should christians still believe in the bible can we have confidence in god and does he have confidence in us at spring harvest next easter discover why you can answer these questions yes yes and yes spring harvest will challenge your thinking it'll feed your mind and your spirit top bible scholars will give substance to your confidence in god and his word find out more about spring harvest online Sponsors of the Bible series on Channel 5. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the third and final part of Unbelievable with me, Justin Briley, the place where Christians and non-Christians get together to talk every week here on Premier Christian Radio. It's part of a wider range of programming every Saturday afternoon called Faith Explored. And later on today, between four and five, I'm going to be chatting to Roma Downey, the actress who is one half of the husband and wife team behind the Bible TV series. So that's worth hanging on for in the profile interview between four and five this afternoon, straight after this program. Uh, next week here on Unbelievable, we're also continuing the biblical theme, shifting to the New Testament. We've got a debate where Razor Aslan, author of Zealot, a best-selling book claiming that Jesus was in fact a political agitator, not the peace-loving Messiah of the Gospels. Well, he's joining me and he's going to be in debate with New Testament scholar Anthony Ladon, who believes Aslan has really gone off piste as far as he's concerned concerning the historical Jesus. That's going to be a really feisty debate next week. Come back for that. Same time, same place here on Premier Christian Radio or indeed online at premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. And of course, we're going to be hearing some of your responses a little later on in today's programme to last week's show. Fabulous intelligent design debate between the leading intelligent design proponent in the world, Stephen Meyer, about his new book, Darwin's Doubt. And that was with evolutionary biologist Charles Marshall of the University of California in Berkeley. So um, uh, we'll hear some of your feedback to that. Um, later on as well, going to be telling you how you can get a hand on one of these uh, copies of Chris Sinkinson's book, Time Travel to the Old Testament. Got five copies to give away. Uh, so uh, listen out for the question a little later on. Plus, um, we've already talked about about the issue of 
Abraham and Isaac. Uh, why would God ask Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac? Well, I asked the same question to New Testament historian N.T. Wright, and we'll hear how he responds to that question a little bit later on in today's show, as well as your responses after I asked you about it on Twitter this last week. Uh, that's all to come here on the programme. Time now, though, to conclude our discussion on the Old Testament. If you want more info and resources all about it, go to premier.org.uk slash the Bible. You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio. Well, just as we uh, wrap up today's conversation, uh, thanks again to Professor Richard Dawkins, Chris Sinkinson and Rabbi Josh Levy, who have been with me on the programme today. Um, Richard, the Old Testament then, you can recognise obviously that there is some value to some, some of the, uh, you know, the language and, and the storytelling in particular as you've appreciated it in the King James Version. But as far as it, it applying to today, do, do you believe that there is simply a disconnect? We need to leave this behind. Why can't we just be moral without reference to these, these ancient stories? Uh, yes, I certainly think that. I, I agree with my colleagues that, that it's, it's very rich um, it's, uh, it's fable, it's myth, um, it, it shares that with the Greek myths, with the myths from all over the world. Many of them do have um, moral meaning for the cultures in which they grew up. I repeat the point that it's entirely arbitrary that we happen to be talking about the Hebrew myth because that's what all four of us are brought up in. Um, we could do exactly the same thing with the, with the Greek myths, with the, with the Indian myths, and you would not wish to live your life according to the, um, to the behavior of Zeus and Apollo and, and, or, or, the, or the Norse gods or anything like that. These are all powerful, rich stories, and we can take them in all sorts of different ways. There is nothing special about the Bible just because we happen to have been brought up in its tradition. Hmm. Um, Josh, as we start to conclude today's program, how, how would you apply the Old Testament for today? Well, I think you know, the question Richard asks, which is, why should we privilege this mm. text? Uh, I would want to say there are things about it which are exceptional. I think it is exceptionally rich. And there is something exceptional about the fact that it has continued to have resonance and be a way for people to think about the world for thousands of years. You know, we're talking about a text which uh, is in places 3,000 years old, which continues to have us arguing about it for an hour on the radio. Uh, and, you know, tenacity in and of itself is not an argument for keeping something, but it, it suggests there is something exceptional about the text. But what's important for me is that Judaism has never read that text uncritically. Whatever its perspective on authorship and origin, uh, that has never stopped Jews from looking at the text and saying, oh, gosh, that looks a bit weird, or I really have to think about how to deal with that, or, you know, is that character behaving morally or not? Or, in the places which are legal texts, how do I want to apply that because there's something that feels strange, difficult there, or something which feels wonderful and fabulous and enriching there? So this is a text which has the ability to enrich our lives, uh, but only if we don't approach it simplistically, either to simplistically reject it or to read it simplistically and take it simplistically in the way that I know that Richard particularly objects to. Chris, finally. I, I think I've got to be honest and say there are two types of answer I'd want to give. One type, obviously, from my faith perspective, I believe in Jesus Christ and therefore through him I have a particular uh, faith response to the Old Testament as, as the word of God. And I, I, that, that is my understanding of, of the Old Testament and why I have a personal vested interest in it. But that's separate, I think, from a more general cultural issue here, which is that I think in an age of, of growing illiteracy and a sense of not being conscious of our history and our culture and our background, I think it's imperative that we can encourage people to read the Old Testament, to understand these foundation documents. You know, if the Inca myths and legends, if we're going to use those words so lightly, if the Inca myths and legends were the foundation documents for our society, we would be living in a very different society today. The, the Old Testament is the earliest documents to provide humane descriptions of how warfare should be fought. So for all of the, the, the terror texts that we might debate and discuss within the legal code, there are some very humane teachings on war and on how society should be organized and on the treatment of the poor and the vulnerable, leading to modern day uh, issues like um, the, the Stop Human Trafficking campaign that friends of mine are involved in or the Jubilee campaign regarding debt uh, and other nations. So I think 
in being conscious of our history, our background, and what Richard has described as great literature, I think we actually only enrich our understanding of these issues we're facing today. And boy, do we need to understand these issues if we're going to be a literate and a historically conscious people able to grapple with the complex moral questions facing us. Richard, thank you very much for joining us by phone today. And um, are, are you um, going to be trying to catch a few episodes of the Bible I, TV I certainly series? will, yes. Thank you. Good, good. Well, thank you very much for being um, with us today. And, of course, you can find out more about Richard Dawkins at richarddawkins.net um, and his latest book, An Appetite for Wonder. Uh, links to that, of course, from today's show as well. Um, thank you also, Chris and uh, Josh, for being with me on the programme today. It's been really interesting to see. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, I'm very glad to be able to share the time with you. Well, I wonder what you thought about today's show. I'm sure you'll want to get in touch as well. Why not do that uh, by emailing me? unbelievable at premier.org.uk and of course I'm going to be giving out the other ways to get in touch with the show via Facebook and Twitter in just a moment's time. Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. So I would be interested to hear your responses, as I say, by Twitter and Facebook as well, at UnbelievableJB if you want to follow me on Twitter, facebook.com slash Unbelievable JB to uh, like the Facebook page, get updates on the programme and uh, what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, and we're going to hear some of your responses via Twitter specifically to this whole question of the um, the near sacrifice of Isaac by Abraham. I asked you about that uh, this last week on Twitter. Get some of your responses to that in a moment's time. Don't forget all those links, uh, as I mentioned, to my guests, to this programme, to the vast archive of past programmes you can find on the podcast and so on, are all available from the show webpage premier.org.uk slash unbelievable and if specifically you want resources to do with the Bible TV series currently airing on Channel 5 uh, what better place to go than premier.org.uk slash the Bible and as I said earlier if you're tweeting about it tonight why not use the hashtag the Bible UK um, that's uh, the, the way you can sort of check what everyone's saying about it as it airs second episode tonight on Channel 5 9pm I uh, wanted to mention uh, that we're giving away five copies of Time Travel to the Old Testament by Chris Sinkinson, published by IVP. Simple question. All you have to do is email me. Uh, name the husband and wife team behind the Bible TV series. OK, name the husband and wife team behind the Bible TV series. I've already mentioned who the wife side of the team is. Uh, can you add the husband's name? Here's a hint. Go to... That resource page I just mentioned at premier.org.uk slash the Bible. And it's not hard to find out. Um, but uh, if you can tell me that via email, uh, I will uh, happily send you a copy of the book if you're one of the five that I pick out of a hat after we've had uh, uh, entries in next week. Unbelievable at premier.org.uk if you want to send me in your answers to that question. And I will accept uh, answers from abroad, not just in the UK. Um, lots of listeners in the States, I know, to Unbelievable via the podcast. Hope you don't feel too aggrieved at um, Richard's uh, various statements about Americans during today's programme. You might want to email in about that, as well as some of the other issues that came up in the programme today. Uh, just a couple of quick things to mention. Um, I'm very pleased to announce that uh, I'm going to be involved with Spring Harvest in 2014. Spring Harvest is a major Bible conference uh, that happens every sort of spring, obviously, around the Easter break. Uh, and uh, it's been going for, what, 25, 30 years now. Um, well, <clears throat> this year it's called Unbelievable, funnily enough, uh, and there is something of an apologetic theme uh, about having confidence in our faith. And so I'm going to be actually leading some of these seminars, uh, it, at least at the uh, Minehead site, over the three weeks in April that it takes place. Uh, so if you're able to come along this year, I do uh, particularly encourage it. Um, it's really for anyone who wants to think through the big questions about their faith. Um, so, so think about coming along to Spring Harvest 2014, and I'd be delighted to see you there if you're a show listener at uh, either Minehead 1, 2 or 3 through April from the 5th to the 18th of April and uh, another fabulous speaker doing the apologetic seminars at the Skegness site at the same time is going to be Tom Price of the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics who's appeared on this programme a number of times. So between Tom and myself we're going to be sharing the, uh, the apologetic seminars looking at some of the big questions around the Christian faith particularly to do with 
uh, God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Uh, so uh, if you'd like to book in, springharvest.org is the website if you want to be involved. Uh, really looking forward to um, uh, meeting a lot of new people as well who, who may come into contact with the show for the first time that way at Spring Harvest this year here in the UK. Uh, that's springharvest.org. Um, let's go to some of your feedback. Um, as I mentioned, I wanted to ask you what you thought of the Abraham and Isaac story that we were discussing here on the show today. I tweeted out earlier this week a still from the Bible TV footage uh, of Abraham about to sacrifice Isaac before the intervention uh, of God and the angel to provide a lamb. Well, um, uh, this was what uh, Anthony had to say when I asked, what do you think? Um, He says, that child lived. How many die in abortion abattoirs? How many are sacrificed to progressivism? Hashtag neo-eugenics. Well, in response, Lord Billy Austin said, What aboutery? Two wrongs don't make a right. Abraham and Isaac is a bad advert for blind faith. Uh, To which uh, Anthony came back to say, But it wasn't blind. Genesis 22 verse 5 says, I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Sam Donoghue says it's a story I would happily rip out. I've never really managed to reconcile myself to any of the explanations of it being okay. Uh, While Dave says to judge it barbaric is to rely on universal objective morality. How else can you say it is wrong? Suggesting there that uh, if Dawkins says it's barbaric, well, by what standard is he judging things to be right or wrong? Ian Clary says uh, God offers the ram, which is a type of Christ. The Isaac story is one of grace. Not the view of um, a jolly nerd who says the problem comes from God telling Abe to kill his son in the first place. Hashtag worst prank ever. Uh, Real Steve Pond in a similarly sceptical mood says a story about an omniscient God who to find something out puts a man to the test to see how he will act. John Richardson is the ugly vicar. Uh, Is that He's not actually ugly. That's just his his, uh, uh, Twitter name. Um, He says, depends which bits of the story one believes. If all, then that's the way God is. If none, no one was harmed. And uh, finally, this one from John G. Anderson says, Isaac was spared to give us life in the death of Christ. And the gospel turns imagined barbarism into actual beauty. Thanks. Uh, A lot of responses to that question when I posted up that picture on Twitter the other day. Uh, Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've also been asking N.T. Wright, who's a well-known biblical historian, some of these tough questions about the Bible. Um, I've actually got some videos on the Unbelievable web page if you want to go there and see him in person answering some tough questions about the Bible, both the Old and New Testament. That's at premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. Well, here's how he answered that question that I asked on Twitter this week. Tom. Wasn't it barbaric for God to ask Abraham to kill his son? Genesis 22 is one of those extraordinary, powerful and difficult chapters that uh, whoever put the book of Genesis together knew it was powerful and difficult already. And I think there's a sense in which that sort of story is not something that we are supposed to pick up and run through a moral filter to say, do we approve of this or not? But we're just supposed to stand in awe and uh, in horror, as it were, at it. Genesis 22 doesn't stand alone. It comes after the story where Abraham has actually taken Sarah's maid, Hagar, and through her he has had a first son, Ishmael. This was not clearly what God wanted him to do. And yet, then, how is Abraham now going to behave in relation to Hagar and Ishmael? And there seems to be almost a brutality about the way he sends them away. Um, And yet it's clear that Isaac is the one who is to be the bearer of the promise. And so I think the Isaac story about Abraham being commanded to sacrifice Isaac is a way of getting Abraham back on track after that very sordid episode. Okay, Abraham, you've done that, but now actually this is the sort of thing you've precipitated. Are you prepared now to give up this one. And so it's a kind of a moral challenge arising out of the very murky moral situation that Abraham is in. Our difficulty again and again with the Bible is that we assume that each incident comes in a clean little box and we hold it up and say, should God have done this or shouldn't he? And the answer is no, take the whole narrative and there's something much deeper and more complicated going on, at the end of which, scary though it is, 
there is a sense of Abraham as the obedient one and of Isaac in Jewish tradition as the willing one, which is, which is just as scary as the Abraham bit. And then, of course, we have to say as Christians that that forms part of the backdrop for when we see in Romans 8, God who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. So we need to see the story in a much larger context. And you right there giving his answer to the uh, thorny issue of Abraham and Isaac and the music there from the Bible TV series. Hans Zimmer is responsible for the score on the series. Uh, again, if you want to get in touch via Twitter, that's at UnbelievableJB if you want to tweet me your thoughts on this whole thing. Let's go to some of your responses to the last several weeks of programming. I just wanted to pick up, actually, on um, the God Question DVD series, which we featured uh, back, I think, in uh, September, October time. Um, and, and again, if you want to get hold of that, a really great resource on the whole area of science and faith with uh, contributors from both sides uh, of the perspectives and both sides of the pond as well. Uh, that's at uh, thegodquestion.tv. Emailing in on the issue of the, the science and faith debate that it's raised, Steve Pond again, uh, who we heard from on Twitter there, says, Unfortunately, due to being a poorly boy, I've had a prolonged absence from work, and having time on my hands, I used it to listen to previous editions of various programmes I enjoy, such as yours. Being of a scientific bent, those are the shows I homed in on, and I've enjoyed the various topics discussed. Really enjoyed particularly the Keith Ward-Michael Roos debate, which was one of the ones that was looking at this question of consciousness uh, in the God Question DVD series. Uh, you also uh, want to say uh, on the subject of the universe, the cosmos, which was the debate between John Lennox and Lawrence Krauss that was featured uh, several weeks ago. You say, if a cosmologist was a Christian, and why shouldn't they be, what is to stop them wishing to investigate what caused our universe to come out of a state trillions of times smaller than a proton? The approach I'm taking is that I don't think many of your Christian guests would expect a Christian climatologist to posit God as the reason for a storm system or a particular environmental change. And it would be easy to provide this example for many other areas of science. But when it comes to the start of the universe, well, that all ceases. Here be dragons, etc. I'm not asking you or any of your Christian guests to change their view, but I would be interested to know if them or you would think it entirely scientific for a Christian cosmologist to look for other causes for the universe apart from God as the climatologist would look for their storm. I ask this in the light of Genesis 1.1, but also that the Bible gives the impression of God being over the weather too. Um, but our understanding of those weather systems today appears to cause no major crisis of faith to anyone, says Steve. Um, Nick is a Christian uh, emailing in, says Krauss said earlier in one of those shows that Christians uphold science until a miracle comes along and then they throw out science. Well, when he went after philosophy, it was interesting to hear him speak about the nature of nothing and then of being while saying he's a scientist who doesn't care about philosophy. So then, is Krauss a scientist until philosophy that helps him comes along and then he's not a scientist? You also wanted to make the point that his statement that there are no authorities in science is nonsense. If that's the case, then first off, thank you for saying I shouldn't buy your book since I wouldn't want to take the opinion of someone who's not an authority. But even worse, since I'm a New Testament historian, does that mean there are no authorities in science, that my opinion of science is just as valid as his is? OK, uh, so, so still responses coming in to those very popular programmes on the God Question uh, DVD. Uh, last week was the debate between Stephen Meyer intelligent design theorist and uh, Charles Marshall, an evolutionary biologist on the uh, book by Meyer, Darwin's Doubt. Uh, Simon in Merseyside says, particularly interesting episode about intelligent design, polite and informative. As an academic with a computer science background, ID advocates often make assertions about information that I would query. But let me focus on one particularly entertaining example from Stephen Meyer. Caveat, I have yet to read his new book. Um, Stephen offered a safe-cracking analogy at the start of the episode. He posited a safe featuring 10 dials with 10 digits each, giving headline odds of 1 in 10 billion, calculated by multiplying the digits on each dial together. Well, this seems improbably large, but is this headline figure a true representation of how hard it is to crack a safe? We've all seen how it's done in old gangster films. The thief puts a stethoscope to the door and the first dial is turned until a click is heard. Again, for the second dial, then the third, fourth, and so on. Instead of one giant leap, the safe cracking becomes a series of smaller steps, ten problems each, with one in ten odds. The total odds of cracking the safe therefore drop to 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10, plus 10 and so on, giving us just 1 in 100. The odds are only improbable if one conveniently forgets the problems can be solved progressively. 
think of it this way. While only Superman can get to the top of the Empire State Building in a single bound, mere mortals can still get to the top by using the staircase. Uh, thank you very much. Um, a different point of view, though, uh, from David Kirkland, who says, uh, thanks for the continued hard work putting on the show each week. Uh, your recent show with Stephen Meyer and Charles Marshall was very good. Um, I think Maya makes a very valid point that our experience in this universe is that intelligence directing information or programming leads to far more ordered results and building complexity. Marshall sounded like no intelligence, information or direction could easily be the default position and we'd just expect that to lead to information and complexity. Uh, you go on to say later on, many times when the subject of intelligent design is discussed, it seems like something of a false dichotomy is put forth when people say the universe is all explained by intelligent design and a higher power or explained completely by science and evolution and no higher power. These categories are useful, but obviously they're only meant to answer certain appropriate questions, as John Lennox has repeatedly mentioned. OK, thank you very much for your thoughts on that. Thanks also to those who have been emailing in on the Strange Fire episode of the, the week before that, uh, when Doug Wilson uh, had an interaction with charismatic Adrian Warnock. Um, and uh, Ian Mackey emailed in to say he thought the last two shows, both between Doug Wilson and Adrian Warnock and Charles Marshall and Steve Meyer, have been excellent. Both discussions where the participants engaged in proper argument with each other addressing the issues. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Ian. Appreciate that. And thanks to everyone who's been getting in touch in the last few weeks. I'm expecting a full mailbag from today's programme as well. So again, if you'd like to get in touch, do email unbelievable at premier.org.uk. And don't forget, you can subscribe to this podcast, vast back catalogue of shows to listen to too. Um, some people are working their way through them at a rate of knots, having started listening recently. Perhaps you can join them too. premier.org.uk slash unbelievable to discover all of that. Finally, let me tell you what's coming up on next week's programme. You're unbelievable. Continuing to uh, look at the Bible, we're shifting to the New Testament, however. Reza Aslan joins me. He's the controversial author of a new book, Zealot, best-selling book too, claiming that Jesus was in fact a religious political agitator, not the peace-loving Messiah of the Gospels. He was a zealot. Well, uh, against him is Anthony Ledon, who's a New Testament scholar from the States, uh, they'll be having a feisty discussion next week at the same time as we continue this focus on the Bible as the uh, Channel 5 airing of the Bible TV series continues through December. In the meantime, have a great week. Hope you can join me again at the same time next time.